word. As always, as we prepare for the service, take a few moments of quiet prayer meditation as Mrs. Dockery plays our prelude this morning.
Go ahead and take your hymn books this morning. We're going to turn over to hymn number 32, Blessed Be the Name. Let's stand together as we sing, Blessed Be the Name. All praise to him who reigns above. can't help think this morning of our brothers and sisters in Ukraine that are going through a mighty time of conflict. If you'll notice that fourth stanza says, the mighty prince of peace. Some of you don't look like you claim that this morning. What's it going to take for you to claim, blessed be the name of the Lord? All praise to him. He is the Lord of our life. Let's sing it on the fourth and sing it like you mean it. All right, here we go. Great music this morning. Mrs. Nockety started off with Worthy uh, to be Praised and a, a great prelude piece in the choir, Fairest Lord Jesus. We were supposed to sing it last Sunday, but we had so many people out, I said, we just can't do it justice. We need a full choir. And so I trust that was a blessing to your hearts this morning. Our scripture this morning comes from Proverbs chapter 28. In verse number six, it says, Better is the poor that walketh in our brightness than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. And God was saying it, it's not what you have materially that makes a difference. It's how you live your life. He said it's better to be poor and walk uprightly than to be rich and be perverse. And then in verse 7 he says, Whoso keepeth the law is a wise son. Wisdom is keeping the word of God. We come on down to verse number 14. It says, Happy is the man that feareth always, but he that hardeneth heart shall fall into mischief. We can either be wise and keep or obey the law of the Lord, or we can harden our heart against it. He tells us in verse 9, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. When we get before God and we say, God, I'm not going to listen. I don't want to hear it. God says, all right, then don't call on me because I don't want to hear you either. Until you're willing to get your heart right with the Lord. Now, sometimes as parents, we go through that with our kids, don't we? They don't want to listen. <laughs> they want to turn their ear. They want to uh, stomp their feet. They want to turn their shoulder away. They harden their hearts. 
But God says a wise child will listen to the instruction of the Father. And we need to listen to the instruction, the Word of God, of our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. As we come to the Lord in prayer this morning, uh, we have been praying on Wednesday night for Deb Hauser's nephew, Gary DeBiase. Uh, he passed away overnight. I got an email from her this morning that he had passed away. And so be praying for Deb. It would be her sister's son. So pray for Deb Hauser and the family. Uh, then Jim Bowmaster's sister, Janet Thomas, she lives out in the Altoona area. Uh, she's in failing health. They've called in hospice. She's had a number of strokes, apparently not eating. Uh, Jim and his wife, or Kathy, are going up tomorrow to visit with her. But if, remember the family, pray for them as well. So that's a Janet Thomas, and that's Mr. Bowmaster's sister. Then I have a thank you note here from Pastor for the church. He says, thank you for your kindnesses in the past several months, the retirement dinner and the very gracious financial gift. Thank you for the book of remembrances and the many kind comments. Most enjoyable to be read and reread many times over. Special thanks to the ladies who worked so hard to assemble it. Greatly appreciated. Thank you for the birthday card and monetary gift and gifts from people. Thank you for the many Christmas cards, financial gifts, and other gifts. And above all, thank you for your many prayers and cards for us during these days. God bless, Pastor and Beverly God. Uh, continue to pray for them. We mentioned on Wednesday night, Beverly had her first follow-up appointment this past Monday uh, from her hip surgery, and the doctor feels like everything is going well. She's supposed to part, start physical therapy tomorrow. And, you know, when they work you over the first time, it's not the, the greatest thing. So she's not necessarily looking forward to that. Uh, but be praying for her that as she goes through the therapy that everything will continue to progress well. Uh, in talking with Pastor, uh, he did start medication for pneumonia on Wednesday. I talked to him briefly on Thursday. I haven't talked to him since then to see how he's been progressing through the week. But continue to pray for him as he recovers from the difficulty he's having as well. And then, as Trevor mentioned, you want to be praying for those in Ukraine uh, of course, Sarah Bright, her parents, David and Kristen Bright, were attended church here for many years. Uh, Kristen was in our, or Sarah was in our youth group, her and her sister Rebecca, and of course they had Matt and Ben and a whole bunch of other ones beyond that. I, I can't name them all, but Sarah and Rebecca, the oldest two, both married Ukrainian young men, and Sarah just went back to Ukraine four months ago. So she's been posting on Facebook. They spent 30 hours in line trying to get to the Romanian border and uh, it was still going to be another two days before they got close. And uh, so they decided to bail out, and they went to another border crossing into Moldova. And at 12.30 last night, they were sitting there waiting, and when the border opened this morning, they were hopeful that they would be able to get across. Uh, they made it across? All right, so that was my, our other concern was that, you know, the government has passed a law that none of the young men were allowed to leave the country. They all had to stay and fight. So Yuri, we wasn't sure where they'd let him across, but they did get across. So they are in Moldova. They have a flight from Germany back to the U.S., so they still have a ways to travel to get to Germany, uh, but then they'll be flying back. So that's an answer to prayer that they were able to get out of the country. So we continue to pray for them. And, of course, as many believers over there, a uh, number of things being posted about the Christians and uh, their solidarity and praying. And we need to certainly lift them up in prayer this morning. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, we thank thee for this day. What a beautiful day it is. What a blessing to be able to come to the house of the Lord. We thank you for these hymns already this morning that have uplifted our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Blessed be his name. Father, we are dead in trespasses and sins. But Christ died for us, God in mercy, provided a means of salvation that we can have life in Christ. We do pray for Deb Hauser and her family and the passing of her nephew, that you would be with them, comfort them during this time. Deb indicated that he's in heaven, so I trust that he was born again. We just pray that that might be a comfort to the family. Father, we pray as well for Jim Bowmaster's sister, Janet Thomas, failing health. We pray that you'd be with her Pray that you give strength and grace to the family, meet each need. 
We pray, Father, for Pastor and Beverly. We're thankful that her surgery went well. We pray now that you would give her healing as she begins the therapy and recovery process, that everything would go smoothly. Give her grace and strength. We pray for Pastor. He's been dealing with this pneumonia. We trust that the medication is a help to him. Give him strength and healing. We pray for the situation in Ukraine. We pray against those that would uh, seek to destroy and disrupt uh, a peaceful nation. We pray against the workers of iniquity. Father, we pray for the Christians that are suffering during this war, that you'll watch over, protect them. Show yourself strong in their behalf. We thank you for answers to prayer that Yuri and Sarah were able to get out of the country with their family. Watch over, protect them as they continue to travel to make their way back to the States. Many others that we do not know that are suffering through great difficulties. But thou reignest on high, and so we pray, Father, that you would rule and overrule in the affairs of men for thy honor and glory. We think of our missionaries serving around the world. We pray for the Polifkas in Belarus. And we believe that they're safe in that country, but yet we realize that that's a satellite nation of Russia. Many of the attacks that have entered in Ukraine have come from the country of Belarus. So we pray for those there ministering under difficult circumstances. Uphold them by thy right hand. Guide and direct and bless in our own nation. Give wisdom to those in leadership to make right decisions. We pray, Father, that you would be honored and glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second hymn this morning will be hymn number 46, O Four Thousand Tongues to Sing. Hymn number 46. <laughs> Sunday morning offering, and again, we appreciate your faithfulness in giving. We will have a special love offering at the end of the service, and that is our pay down the debt offering. We trust that you've been praying about that. Uh, we still have about 10000 on the Parsonage loan that we'd like to finish, uh, get that paid off here before we get into the summer months, and so whatever you give in the second offering today will go towards that, and we trust that you'll uh, give faithfully and that God will bless you for your giving. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Joe Pretty, would you lead us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the peace that you give through Christ. We thank you for our eternal life through him. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to give back a portion of what you blessed us with. Lord, may we be cheerful givers. We love you and praise you for all your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Go ahead and take your hymn books for our final hymn this morning, hymn 453. He keeps me singing. Let's stand together as we sing hymn 453. As the ladies come and join me for special music, I just wanted to read a quick scripture for you and give you a quick thought. 2 Corinthians 12, uh, starting verse 9 says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will, will, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I am becoming a fool and glorying. And as we sing this song this morning, um, we, as, we as Christians are a peculiar people. We have the ability to both rejoice in our infirmities and our weaknesses and our persecutions, as well as in the joys of life. Um, and we most definitely need to be trophies of his grace in life and in death. Oh Lord, I trust your grace, it is enough, enough for me. In every trial I shall trace its all sufficiency. And Lord, I trust your strength in you. Strong. My failing flesh will learn at length a daily trial song. Oh, trust in God, my soul, and look into his face. Oh, trust in Then I shall stand. 
Thank you for that special this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I saw a picture on Facebook of my youngest granddaughter sitting up. I said, well, apparently I haven't seen her for a while. I said, we need to have the kids up. So we had Tim and Megan up on Friday night so I could spend some time with the granddaughters and... Uh, I said, you know, I'm going to make some ice cream. It went so well the other week at our fellowship. I'll make some homemade ice cream. Well, I ran that freezer for an hour, and it would not freeze. And I said, boy, I'm sure glad this didn't happen at the fellowship. I didn't know what was wrong. I just couldn't figure it out. So we, we drank our, our ice cream soup, and uh, it tasted good. It, just, it was just very liquidy. The next morning I get up, I take the shower, and, you know, you think about the strangest things in the shower. I'm in the shower, and all of a sudden, it hit me. I never put in the evaporated milk. That's why it didn't set up. I forgot one of the ingredients. I don't know why I thought of that in the shower, but that's when it came to me. that Oh, yeah, you're supposed to put a can of evaporated milk in. <laughs> so I'm glad I didn't make that mistake on the night of our fellowship. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we are coming this morning to our third picture of the church, the building of Christ. We looked at the bride of Christ. We said the church is distinguished by her beauty, her love, and her virtue. Then we looked at the body of Christ. The church is to function as a single unit. And while each part is different and unique when functioning together, they're able to accomplish the purpose of God. And so this morning we come to the third and final picture of the church, the building of Christ. As the building of Christ, the church, and more specifically each person in the church, serves as the temple or the habitation of God through the Spirit. As a believer, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our text is going to be back in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, but we'll begin in chapter 6, verse 15. It says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What, know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. And he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Verse 19, what, know ye not that your body is the temple, the dwelling place of the Holy Ghost? which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 
Paul begins this passage with reference to the church as the body of Christ. As believers, we are members of Christ's body. We are also his dwelling place through the Holy Spirit. We often speak in terms of salvation as accepting Jesus Christ into your heart. The question is, how can Christ dwell in your heart and be seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven at the same time? Well, we know that he's omnipresent. God is omnipresent. So Christ is omnipresent. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. So he is able to dwell in me and in you and every believer and be seated in heaven at the same time. But secondly, although there are three distinct persons in the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, they are all one God. So Christ dwelling in us is accomplished through his Spirit, which is one with the Son and with the Father. Since the church is made up of individual believers, the church is thus the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you want to keep a finger there in 1 Corinthians, because we'll be back to chapter 3 in a moment, but turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to read the last four verses. Begin reading in verse number 19 of Ephesians chapter 2. It says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Notice verse 20. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Verse 22 teaches that we are builded together as an habitation of God through the Spirit. That is that we as a church collectively serve as the temple or the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Now, while we are here in Ephesians chapter 2, I want you to notice the structure of the building. He says in verse 20 that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. The apostles and prophets are the foundation. And we are the building that is framed or built upon that foundation. All right, we'll come to that later in the message, but I want you to notice that in verse number 20 while we're here. And then turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and this will be our text this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We'll begin reading in verse 9, and we'll read down to verse number 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Beginning in verse 9, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon his foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Paul ends this passage in verse 16 and 17 with wording that's very similar to what we read in chapter 6. The Bible is absolutely clear that as a believer, my body is the temple, the habitation, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. As such, I must be careful not to defile or in any way defame or deface my body. Verse 17, we are given a warning. If we defile the temple of God, it says, him shall God destroy. The word destroy is the same as the word defile in the Greek. And it means to waste, to spoil or ruin, to corrupt, 
defile or destroy. You know, food that is not cared for properly will spoil. It's wasted. It's ruined and not fit for consumption. And so this morning, I want us to notice four truths about the church as the building of God from this passage in 1 Corinthians 3. First, we're going to notice the architect, then the builders, the foundation, and finally, the materials. The architect, the builders, the foundation, and the materials. Let's pray. Father, we thank thee for the time to be in thy house this morning. As we come to the word of God, we pray the Holy Spirit of God will have liberty to speak to our own hearts this morning. Help us to grow in our knowledge of Jesus Christ and our knowledge of the church, its purpose, and what our role is in the church. Help us to grow in Christ-likeness. If there be one here that does not know Christ this morning as their own personal Lord and Savior, they've never been born again, speak to their own heart about their need today. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. We begin with the architect of the church. In Webster's 1828 dictionary, he defines an architect as a person skilled in the art of building, one who understands and makes it his occupation to form plans and designs of buildings and superintend the artificers, that is, the builders or contractors employed. In verse number 10, Paul ends with these words, ye are God's building. The word building means architecture or structure. The statement implies at least three things. First, it implies oversight. Oversight. As the architect, God is overseeing the building of your life. He's aware of and orchestrates every event and circumstance in your life. Nothing in your life is a result of chance or luck. God oversees it all. On Wednesday evening, we began looking at the life of Joseph. The predominant theme in the life of Joseph is the providence of God. And we define the providence of God as every event and circumstance in your life is controlled by God for our good and his glory. We see that in the life of Joseph. He was hated of his brothers, sold into slavery. He was falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and thrown into prison. And you could, could say that all those things were working against him, but God was working in Joseph's life. He was building in his life a structure that would one day rule, for the most part, the known world in that day, second in command only to Pharaoh in Egypt. God is the architect of your life. He has the oversight of everything that happens in your life. Think about Job. Satan came before, Job, before God and God said, Hast thou considered my servant Job? He's upright, one that feareth God and cheweth evil. God gave Satan permission to touch all that he had, but still Job retained his integrity. And so Satan came back and he didn't bring it up, but God did. He said, Hey, Satan, how's things going with Job? He said, well, you haven't let me touch him. He says, all right, you can touch him, but spare his life. And so he smote him with boils from the top of his head to the sole of his foot. And still, Job refused to renounce God. And in the end, God blessed Job with twice as much as he had before. But he had to go through some difficulties. But God was using that to build in his life. You might be going through some things in your life and you might question, Lord, why are you taking me through this? We don't always know the why, but we know that God is doing the building. That he's overseeing everything in your life and nothing is happening by accident or by chance. He's got his sovereign hand on everything in your life. We think about the situation in Ukraine. What, has God just washed his hands and stepped back and said, well, let them do what they want? No, God's got a plan. I don't know what it is. I'm not God. But God's got a plan. God's got a purpose. You say, well, you know, all of that, that's going to impact us. We're paying more at the gas pump. We're paying more at the grocery store. And, you know, it may. But God's got a purpose and a plan in that too. And I don't know what all God's going to do in our lives. Through, we've just came through this pandemic. Now you've got this war situation. And this life is at best uncertain. Constantly changing. Trials and difficulties. But never forget that God is doing a work. He's building. He's, he sees it all. Not only does it imply oversight, but second, it implies labor. 
God is the one doing the building. It is true that he uses individuals and circumstances as tools, but God is the one doing the work. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. God is the one who is building your life. Sometimes we think, well, I did this or I did that. No, God did it. God is the one that is doing the building. Thirdly, it implies ownership. Because God is building you, you are his creation. Therefore, he owns you. Not only are you his by creation, but you're also his by redemption. We read earlier in 1 Corinthians 6, for ye are not your own, for you are bought with a price. If you are a child of God, Jesus Christ paid for you at the cross of Calvary with his own blood. And your life is not yours to live as you see fit. It is yours to live for the one who died for you, to live for Christ. God owns you. So as the architect, he oversees the work in your life. He is the one doing the labor, working in your life, and he is the one who owns you. Hebrews 3, 4, and 6 says, For every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Christ is the son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. God is the architect of this life. And Christ is the architect of his house, whose house we are, the church. So we see the architect of the church, God himself. He's building in our lives. He's building in the church. Secondly, I want you to notice the builders of the church. Now, I know I just said God is the one building your life. But I also said that God uses individuals and circumstances at, as tools in the process. Consider a contractor. The contractor is responsible for building the structure, but he may use some contractors and other laborers to help in the process. Having someone else pour the cement or do the plumbing or doing the wiring does not diminish the responsibility of the contractor. So we hired a contractor to build our addition. He had different people come in to do different things along the way. We, if we had a problem and came back to him and said, this was not done correctly, he can't say, well, that was the subcontractor's job. That's not my fault. No, he's the contractor. It is his responsibility. Christ is the architect, but he uses us as laborers in the process. In verse 10, Paul says that God, by his grace, had chosen him to be a wise master builder. The word master builder means chief constructor or architect. Paul was commissioned by God to oversee the construction of the church. He was sent as an apostle to the Gentiles, and everywhere he went, he established and built churches. Now, we're not talking about a physical building. As far as I know, Paul never built a physical building church. What he built were churches, that is, bodies of believers being brought together to form a local church. They met in people's homes. They met wherever they would find a place, but it was a church. It was a group of believers. The master builder, the church planner, is not alone in this endeavor. Verse 9 says that we are laborers together with God. Verse 10, Paul says, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. He goes on to say, let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. The pastor, the missionary, the evangelist may be the master builder in planting a church, but we are laborers together in the process of building the church. Previously in the chapter, Paul uses the illustration of farming. He said in verse number nine, ye are God's husbandry. And then he transitions to ye are God's building and continues on. So let's go back and look at verse number eight. When he was talking about farming, he said, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed? Even as the Lord gave to every man, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. 
You're God's husbandry. You're God's building. In the church at Corinth, there were divisions, envying, strife. The believers began to focus on or to follow after the master builders. Hey, we're going to follow Apollos. We're going to follow Paul. And Paul said, you need to follow Jesus Christ. You've gotten your eyes off the architect and you're looking at the builders, the laborers. Jesus Christ, God, is the one that gives the increase. He's the one doing the building. The building of a church is not a competition. It's not. It's, about trying to it's not about trying to build the largest or most attractive or most active church. It's about being faithful to sow the seed and to help build the lives of others. Ultimately, God's the one who determines how much increase is given and how large a church is built. Our job is to be faithful so that whatever we build is built for God's glory. Long after I have departed this life and entered into glory, should the Lord tarry his coming, I trust that the work that I have left behind will continue to the praise of his glory. As a believer, you have a responsibility to labor in the building of the church. Just as you have a responsibility to function as part of the body, you also have to serve as a laborer in the church. The good news is, is that you're not responsible for the increase or the final product. God is the architect. We are simply serving under his leadership. Some missionaries come back and they have reports of many people being saved. Others come back and report just a very few. But that doesn't mean one's better than the other. God in his sovereign will decides how large a work becomes, how many people are added to the church. God's the one who saves people. God's the one that adds them to the building. But we must do our part in laboring for the Lord. So we see the architect is Jesus Christ. We are laborers together with him. We are builders in the church. Thirdly, I want to notice the foundation of the church. Verse 11 says, Other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation of the church. As we read previously in Ephesians 2, Paul gives more detail regarding that foundation. He says, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. The cornerstone is set first, and from that corner, the foundation is laid. If the cornerstone is not square or not properly laid, the entire foundation will be off and thus impossible to build upon. We have been involved in Servant's Heart Camp Ministry from nearly the beginning. We used to take young people down to Camp Liberty in York, and then when they were up in Hughesville, and then when they bought the property in Ramey, we have made trips out there most every year to help with work projects and to take young people to camp. One year, I went out and I got to help build a building. I, I actually did several different jobs uh, in, over the course of years, but one year in particular, I had to help lay the block. Now, I've never laid block. I was not the chief master builder. You know what I had to do? I had to hand down the cement blocks and I had to take the hoe and stir the, the mortar. That was my job, you know, grunt work. <laughs> I had no, no skill when it came to laying block, but I could pick up the blocks and hand them to the guy that was laying them and I could mix up the cement and pour it into buckets and keep, keep him well fed. He didn't have to crawl up and down all the time. He stayed down there working on the wall and I was giving him materials. But when we were getting ready to lay that block, they had dug the footer and poured the footer. And so he comes and he, he wants to lay that first block. And he measured. And he measured. And he measured. And I think he spent a half hour measuring or longer to make sure that that first block was right. He needed a straight line coming down the length of the building. He needed a straight line going across the width of the building. And then from those two corners, he came back in the cornerstone, and the diagonals had to be exactly the same. And they say, measure twice, cut once. He measured 50 times. I mean, he just kept measuring and measuring. He was determined that that block had to be in the exact spot before he went any further. 
And you know me, I'm like, why is this taking so long? Come on, let's just start some light. We're, we're here to lay block. But if that building was not square, you wouldn't have noticed it laying the block maybe. But the poor guys that came to build the structure on top, when they started to put that flooring on and, and lay the, the, the joists, the floor joists, if that building wasn't square, they would have got themselves into a mess. And the further up you went, the worse it would have gotten. I was back another time having to put up the rafters on the roof. And, you know, we, it, we, we needed a square building. But if it wasn't square by the time you got to the roof, it was too late. But it all began with that first block. It had to be laid perfectly. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Keep a finger there in Corinthians and come back to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Beginning in verse number 4. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 4 says, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built upon a spiritual house, or built up a spiritual house, and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they were also they were appointed. In verse 6, Paul identifies Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone, and in so doing, he quotes Jeremiah 28, 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Peter also tells us that this precious cornerstone is a living stone, and the house is not a physical house but a spiritual house made up of living stones. We are the living stones that make up the church. And because the church is made up of living stones, the church itself is alive. Notice also in terms of Christ, the living stone, that you can either build your life upon the stone or you can stumble over it. He says in verse 8, that this stone that we are to build upon, it became a stone of stumbling or a rock of offense to those who were disobedient. You can either build your life on the rock or the rock can become a rock of offense. The builders, the Jews, they rejected Christ. Psalm 118 verses 22 and 23 says, The stone which the builders refused has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. As a builder, are you willing to build your life on Jesus Christ? Or will you, like the Jews, reject him as the cornerstone? Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. And from that cornerstone is laid the foundation, the Bible says, of the apostles and prophets. The apostles represent the New Testament. The prophets represent the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is the living word. And the word was revealed in the Old Testament to the prophets. It was revealed in the New Testament to the apostles. In other words, it is the word of God that serves as the foundation for the building of the church. You cannot build a church solely on the New Testament without the Old, nor can you build a church on the Old Testament without the New. The church must be built upon the whole counsel or the whole word of God. The apostles and prophets were men that God used to give us the word of God. But the word of God can only be considered the foundation when we as builders are willing to obey it. Peter here identifies those who stumble or those who are offended as being disobedient. You remember the story in Matthew chapter 7 of the wise man and the foolish man? The wise man who built his house upon the rock was, pict was a picture of the man who hears the word of God and doeth them. The foolish man who built his house upon the sand was a picture of the man who hears the word of God and doeth it not. 
church is not built on men. It's built on the word of God spoken by these men. Now, that's not to say that the men themselves don't have a part to play in the building, for they are also part of the living stones. The building, the foundation must always be laid first. Some people say the Old Testament saints are not part of the church, but that's not true. They make up the foundation. They're the prophets. The apostles, the prophets, the men of God who came before, they're the foundation upon which we are to build even today. You know, when you enter a building, you came into church this morning, you probably didn't think a lot about the foundation. You walk into a cathedral, you walk in and say, wow, you, what do you do? You look up, right? You, know, you walk into a cathedral, you look, wow, look at that. The chandeliers, the height of the ceiling, the big stained glass windows. Wow, we admire the beauty. We don't go down and look at the basement. You don't go down and inspect the foundation unless you plan on buying it. And then you want to start down there. A lot of people have bought homes that looked really good, right? Wow, this is our dream home. And then they found out there were a lot of problems in the foundation down below. You know, if you don't have a proper footer drain around it, you're going to get water in. The block, is maybe it's not been parged on the outside. Maybe it's not been dry locked on the inside. You can get moisture damage. There might be cracks in the foundation. All kinds of things can happen in the foundation. And regardless of how that house looks on the top, You've seen pictures when they have a flood and it washes away the foundation and the whole house topples into the river. <laughs> That's what happens when the foundation gives way. We don't pay a lot of attention to the foundation, but it is the foundation which determines the quality of the structure. Any person who endeavors to add to the building of Christ but does not take into consideration what has been done before is a fool. When we disregard our past, despising those who have gone before, we are removing the foundation. And when we do that, whatever building we do, it will not last. Many occasions over history we have seen where a person has come into a church or into an institution of some sort and they've changed, taken away the foundation. And it's not long before the whole thing falls apart. Even though we live and admire the upper structure, it's the foundation that determines the value of the building and therefore is the greater of the two. And that brings us to our fourth and final thing this morning, the materials of the church. We've seen the architect, that's God. The builders, that's you and I. The foundation, that's Jesus Christ and the word of God. What are the materials of the church? When building a building, you must not only take into consideration the foundation upon which you are building, but you must also consider the quality of the materials you are using in the building process. Verse 12 identifies, back in our text in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 12 identifies two groups of materials. Those that can abide the fire, the gold, silver, and precious stones, and those that cannot abide the fire, the wood, hay, and stubble. At the judgment seat of Christ, every believer will give account of himself to God. I will not give an account for you and you will not give an account for me. We will give an account of ourselves. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. The judgment seat of Christ is not about salvation. The judgment seat of Christ is for believers only. Everyone who appears at the judgment seat of Christ, their salvation is already a settled matter. Otherwise, they wouldn't be there. The matter of salvation, you could say, is prerequisite to this judgment. What then is the purpose of the judgment? It is the judgment where we will give account for what we have done for Christ. We will give an account for what we have built and how we have built it. Our works will be judged by fire. That which abides the fire will be rewarded, while that which is consumed will be lost. What is the fire? It's not the fire of hell. The judge is Jesus Christ himself. In the opening chapter of Revelation chapter 1, John gives us a description of the Lord. And I want you to listen as I read part of that. Beginning verse 12, it says, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. That represents the seven churches. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, speaking of Christ, 
clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow. And notice this, his eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like undefined brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand the seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, speaking of the word of God. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And John said, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Verse 14, he said, his eyes were a flame of fire. At the judgment seat of Christ, nothing will be hid from the eyes of God. He will look upon our works, what we have done. He will see our motives, whether they were pure. He will see our actions, whether they were true. And anything that was done in a wrong way or for the wrong reason will be consumed. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ comes again, receives us unto himself, there's going to be a test. He's going to try our works. God's going to put our works to the test to prove them, whether they were done for the glory of God or not. Back in our text in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15, he says, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Again, the judgment is not dealing with salvation. It's only concerned with what we have done for Christ following our salvation. What then are the building materials that abide the fire? What constitutes gold, silver, and precious stones? First of all, work that is built on truth. Work that is built on truth. The truth is the word of God. In John 18, 38, Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? Many people today are still asking that same question. What is truth? They would say there is no absolute truth. Everything is relative. Such teaching is a lie. There is absolute truth. It's the word of God. Any teaching, any faith, any work that is not grounded in truth will not abide the fire. It may sound good, it may look good, but if it's not truth, it's a lie. How can we discern that which is false? By knowing truth. I'm afraid that there is much done in Christianity today in the name of the Lord that is not truth, and one day it will be revealed by fire. Work that will abide is work that is done in truth. Secondly, it's work that is built in integrity. In Joshua 24, 14, the Bible says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. The word sincerity speaks of integrity. It means to be whole or without blemish. You've heard pastor give this illustration in the past. When a, when a potter made a vessel, if the vessel had a crack in it, the potter could take wax and fill in that crack. He could paint over it. And when you look at it, it would look perfect unless you held it up to the light. Because the clay that made up the vessel would not allow light to pass through it. But where the wax was, the light could penetrate it and would reveal the crack. Such a vessel is not sincere. It lacks integrity. Joshua says we are to serve the Lord in sincerity, in integrity, in truth. Are there cracks in the building of your life? Are you filling it in with wax and painting it over thinking no one will ever know? The judgment seat of Christ, God will reveal all the cracks in our lives. By the way, I've got lots of them in my life. So if you feel like you have a lot in yours, that's okay. You're in the same boat as the rest of us. <laughs> we all have a lot of cracks in our life. We've filled them in with wax. But thankfully, God is a gracious God, a forgiving God. But that doesn't mean we should go through life filling in the cracks. The goal is to avoid the cracks in the first place, to live a life of integrity. 
Thirdly, not only is work that abides the fire, work that is built in truth, work that is built as integrity, but third, it's work that is done for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. We quote that at the Wilds camp before every meal. But sometimes I wonder, do the young people really take time to think about what does it mean to do something for the glory of God? When the Bible says, do whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God, what does that mean? Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. What does it mean to do something to the glory of God? It means, first of all, to do it wholeheartedly. Give it your all. Half-hearted service will not abide the fire. You say, well, Lord, I did what you said, but did you do it passionately? Did you do it with your whole heart, or did you do it just enough to get by? You remember your days in school when you had an assignment? Did you ever do an assignment just enough to get by? You knew it wasn't your best. You knew you could do better, but hey, that's all I need to do, so that's all I'm going to do. I did just enough. That doesn't work when it comes to the work of the Lord. God says, whatever you do, you need to do it heartily, wholehearted service. But secondly, it's done for God and not for the praise of men. John 12, Jesus tells us the chief rulers of the synagogue who believed on him, they were saved, but they would not profess him publicly for fear of the Pharisees that they would put them out of the synagogue. And Jesus said in verse 43, they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear of man bringeth a snare. As a believer, what kind of building are you constructing? At the judgment seat of Christ, will the work you are doing abide the fire? Are you building in truth and integrity for God's glory? Or do you labor for the praise and recognition of men? Perhaps you're not building at all. As a believer, you have a responsibility to be building, to be laboring in the work of the Lord. No one is exempt. I grew up in a family of three boys. Every now and again, we'd be given a task to do. And for whatever reason, my younger brother seemed to always have homework. Go figure. I used to say, well, I've got homework too. And mom would let him go do his homework instead of making him go help us out in the barn. I didn't feel like that was fair. Still don't. <laughs> we all had a part to play. But he was the baby of the family, and what baby wants, baby gets, right? Still have a sore spot. But you expect everybody to have their, do their part, and the church is no different. We all need to do our part. No one's exempt. Perhaps you've never been born again. In the book of Ezra, when Zerubbabel and Jeshua were rebuilding the temple, certain of the chief fathers who did not believe, they sought to join them. But Zerubbabel said, Ye have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God. But we ourselves together will build. If you've never trusted Christ, you have no part in the building in the work of the Lord. The first step is to give your heart and life to Christ. But if you are saved, and there is something God wants you to do in terms of building his church. Let's pray. Father, we thank thee for this day. We thank you for this picture of the church. And we realize that we are the church. When we talk about Christ, God being the architect of the church, we realize that God is building our lives. He oversees every aspect of our life. He's working in our lives. And he's doing it for his honor, for his glory, because we belong to him. We think about the builders in the church and we realize that, that we are subcontractors to Christ. And while God is overseeing the whole work, we have things that we have to do. We can't just come and sit in a pew and expect God to build the church. He's going to use us and work through us to build the lives of other people through witnessing and sharing our testimony, through discipling them, through encouraging them and helping them in spiritual matters, and praying for them. We see the foundation, Father. We realize that the Word of God is the foundation upon which we need to build. 
Help us not to cast aside those who have gone before, but to honor them as wise master builders. We think as we come upon the 75th anniversary, the, their 50th anniversary of the church this summer, Father, we are thankful for those who have gone before and have labored in the work. And we pray that we would be careful to honor them and to recognize what they have done and not to cast it aside because it's that foundation upon, upon which we are building today. And we think of the materials that we use, Father, help us to build in truth, in integrity for the glory of God, not for the praise of men. Guide and direct in our invitation this morning in Christ's name, amen. Let's take our psalm books and turn to 368, Have I Done My Best for Jesus. 368 in your psalm books. We'll stand together as we sing. If God has spoken to your heart this morning, if you need to be saved, we'd invite you to come. Some will take the word of God and share with you what it means to be saved. Perhaps God has spoken to your heart about an area of building. There's some cracks in your life that need to be confessed and forsaken. We invite you to come and just make it a matter of prayer here at the altar as we stand together and sing 368. I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus who died upon the cruel tree? I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus who died upon the cruel tree? This is our special offering this morning for our pay down the debt. And so I trust that you uh, have been praying about it and that you'll give graciously this morning. And we'll use everything that comes in through this offering to go towards the Parsonage loan. Let's go to Lord and pray this morning. Mark Littleton, would you pray for the offering, please? Thank you. 